You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. For many delicious donuts and history BFFs out there, it is back to school season. Whether it's back to school for your mini donuts or yourself, finding time to make a delicious and nutritious meal can be really tough. When I was an elementary school teacher, I would often just girl dinner it up for the first few weeks of school. Um, And I wish I would have had something like Factors fresh, never frozen meals in my fridge to make life a little bit easier. These delicious dietitian approved meals are ready in just two minutes and there are so many flavors and options that fit so many preferences like maximizing protein intake, avoiding meat, or simply eating a well-balanced meal. And if you'd like to give Factor a try, you can head over to factormeals.com slash FTL50 and use code FTL50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code FTL50 at factormeals.com slash FTL50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Happy eating, and now let's get back to the episode. Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, weird history, and we have our author interview special that we love to do from time to time when TK sends out her chaotic messages or emails. And sometimes we get answers from the author. And today we did. I'm so happy to introduce Dr. Angela Stien. She is an author, obviously, a museum researcher, a historian, and a storyteller. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so excited that you replied to me because I I love to just randomly DM people. And I actually found (laughs) Dr. Angela from a Google search that I was doing. If you have been a listener of For the Love of History for a while, I'm sure you heard the Egyptian tattoo episode that we did a long time ago and I just re-released it in the interim between season eight and season nine and while I was doing research for that episode I was having some moral ickiness some moral conflicts about showing remains of the mummies with the tattoos and apparently I was not the only one nor the first one to think about that moral conflict because I came across Dr. Angela's book Mummified the stories behind Egyptian mummies in museums and believe it or not this book on mummies contains no images of mummies (laughs) (laughs) So first of all, before we dive into your book, I'd love to know about your background. How did you get into mummies, Egyptology, history? Please let us know. I think I have a very unusual background, but also a very usual one in that when I was 12, 13, I decided I wanted to be an Egyptologist. And that's (laughs) the very usual one. I think a lot of us went through this phase. Um... But I think maybe the difference is that I just never gave up on it. So everyone's yeah. like, it's going to pass. And um, it did not. <laughs> but um, I, for a bit of context, I, I grew up in the suburb of Paris. So I think, you know, one of the things is I had a lot of sort of exposure to, to the world of Egyptology because of, you know, France involvement um, with Egypt and especially with the history of Egyptology. Um, which is something I'm really interested about. So, of course, you know, I grew up, I had the Louvre, but also the obelisk, all of these sites that kind of sort of nurture your your interest. But I decided, you know, that very early on that this is what I was going to do and the shape and form uh, wasn't very defined. It changed a lot, but it's really something that I got really uh, interested in at a very young age, but not really Egyptian 
mummies as a topic of research. So I wanted to be an Egyptologist, but I didn't even ever imagine that um, first that I would uh, do all my studies in English and move to England, <laughs> but also that it would actually be on human remains. And maybe that's a bit reassuring that at 13, I did not want to study human remains, but yeah. it's sort of like it's a journey and a development and something that we can sort of go into a bit more, but it's uh, really led me to, to you know, being um, you know, a human remains researcher and especially on ethics related questions. Yeah, that's incredible. You don't really think about, at least I didn't think about the ethics of Egyptology and the ethics of archaeology in general until I was much older. So what got you started with ethics and especially this question of whether it's ethical or not to show images of mummies. How did this journey start? So for me, what is really important is that what journey. And I think a lot of ethics researcher, the way that we're presented, we look like we're saint. We just always had the ethical approach to things. I don't think it's the case for most people, but it's not mm. for me. And for me, it's been not a journey of learning, but it's very much been a journey of unlearning. Mm. So I used to run a so I ran a project called Mummy Stories that's mm -hmm. um, you know seven eight years old and at the beginning it was absolutely covered with images of human remains and for me it's very important to be transparent about this yeah. because that's also how I'm good at communicating this it's because I've been there done that done the mm -hmm. thinking and now I'm trying to explain to you what my thinking is in a non-prescriptive way, because we're all on a different journey. I went from being a historian of, an ancient historian, not very long, then a historian of Egyptology, then a museum a historian and a museum researcher. And my research has been for now 10, 12 years exclusively about Egyptian human remains. And it's been the exposure uh, to the research, but also to those bodies, spending a lot of time in storage rooms, not just with, not exclusively with Egyptian human remains, but with other human remains. When I work at the Science Museum, for example, in London, um, that has, you know, sort of eighth in my questioning, but also it's the practice of, you know, walking on mummy st stories and sharing all of those pictures and having, you know, a laptop and a phone full of photographs and feeling gradually that if I'm explaining and trying to question what people did in the past, trying to understand isn't what we're doing now just a displacement in practice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that right? And then the decision came, you know, a few years ago that that I wouldn't share photographs of human remains on the website because there were some human remains that I wouldn't share and some that I would. And I was like, well, you know, where is the value? What are some, you know, people more deserving of respect and so on. And so when it came to doing a book, I thought this is actually an opportunity to question the practice of having the face of a mummy as the cover of a book, which is so common. Yeah. Especially, you know, around, you know, uh, some, some more famous like Ramses or, you know, mm -hmm. mummified bodies that are more famous. And so that is what sort of led me to think, well, actually, that's going to be a clause in my book contract. I'm pretty flexible on the book but there will not be any photographs of human remains to set a precedent. And I think for me, that's also what, you know, being a researcher and, and sort of a thinker in, in the field is, is that we're going to try it and do it once and then hopefully more people will do that. Yeah, that's excellent. Can you remember, was there a moment in time or a particular case that you were studying where you had this maybe aha moment or oh shit moment where you're like, I can't, mm. I can't show these. I can't do this. I can't upload these pictures. Was there anything like that or was it more gradual than that? So for me, a lot of the the thinking goes back to, to the mummified man that's at the Louvre because that is where, so I talk a lot about him in, in my book, but it's also my first encounter with Egyptian mummies was with a physical real person mm -hmm. and that's very different from most people so I had have watched the mummy movie the first time six <laughs> months ago um, <laughs> so I had I had literally no exposure to any of you know maybe Scooby-Doo uh, but um so it's which is very unusual for the film so I grew up wanting to be an Egyptologist that has never watched I've still not watched Indiana Jones I'm very 
completely sort of unusual path. That's where my unusual path really is. Uh, but but my first encounter was very young. So with 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 this man who's been on display since the opening of the Louvre, so eighteen you know twenty six twenty seven, mm-hmm. and um, it means that my encounter with with those um, remains has always been with them as people. And I've always mm-hmm. you know had this thing when I was younger. I would go and you know I send the book. I'd go and say hi, and and you know it's a very quiet conversation. But it's always been in that framework. So for me, that has influenced the practice today. And so the more you think about this, the more, you know, I think your thoughts progress. For me, the haha moment is social media. It's mm. seeing them on Instagram. It's seeing them being, I think perhaps my moment was when there was this, you know, episode of the reconstructed voice of a mummified person. I don't know if you heard of this story that happened a few years ago that was using sort of, you know, 3D scanning to supposedly reconstruct the voice of a mummy. Obviously, the result was completely um, unuseful and interesting in my opinion, but also, but it's sometimes it's research. And so it's not so much judging that, but it's the reaction on social media Mm. was pretty dreadful if you think of them as a person it was a lot of of, you know jokes and a lot of memes and a lot of things and then whether it was on you know twitter at the time or on instagram i have started seeing things that just gradually were pushing the boundaries of ethics and i thought well if i share pictures i'm basically putting them out there to be used that way yeah. And it's very different than if you show them, for example, in a conference, or, which, you know, I no longer do, but also can think can be useful for teaching and things like this. Mm-hmm. That is very different because you sort of control the narrative, not in a controlling way, but in making sure that it doesn't, you know, get used for something else. And so I realized that that moment that what I was uploading online could be served, used for, for another purpose, which was against what I was trying to do. So it's not being prescriptive. It's not saying this should never be done. Mm -hmm. It's saying I'm not going to do it because I don't want my work and the work that other people are doing because a lot of the pictures, they came from people that send me stories Mm -hmm. to be used for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, that's kind of one of the wonderful and also terrible things about social media is once you put that out there, it's out and you have no control over how people use it, in what way people use it, and what they say around those images. So I can imagine that being really weird in a way. But it was also very interesting because Mm -hmm. since then, the walk still continues, the conversation continues, Mm -hmm. and it gave me an opportunity or approach to be more creative in the way that I share those stories. And I think sometimes we're like, look at this, you know, very graphic photograph. How do you feel about it? That's Mm -hmm. not the only way. That's definitely not the most creative way to elicit emotion and conversations. Yeah. So let's shift over to your book a little bit and talk about those creative ways. So can you tell us a little bit of an overview of what your book is about? Yes. So it's very much a journey of thinking and of learning and unlearning what Egyptian mummies are as, you know, as sort of material bodies, but also Mm -hmm. why they're in museums. And it's a journey through time. It's it's based in France and in England, and it goes through sort of the very uh, intricate, but also very little known, sometimes pretty strange stories about how Egyptian mummified bodies ended up in museums. For me, the reflection of the book is you go to England in the middle of England, and you will find a museum that has Egyptian mummies in the most green, wet, cold, sorry, England, Uh, you know, weather, landscape, environment. And my thinking is, do you ever stop and look at them and think, why? Yeah. How did they end up here? Why are they here? Why am I just having a little stroll, drinking my little coffee, walking in a museum that's free and just just seeing an Egyptian mummified body and just being like, oh, yeah, just another one, like every museum, without questioning how it ended up here. Because if you think about it, is that is what is very strange. Egyptian mummified bodies are not strange. The fact that they exist in that environment 
is strange and the fact that we don't question it is interesting to me and that is very much what the book is about so it goes mm-hmm. through all these stories about how they were brought from egypt and all of those disasters and all of these you know very strange practices some very wrong practices mm-hmm. but all of it is really to let you to the question of why are they here today and why do we go and see them without judgment but more of a journey of you know i hope people close it and they're like i have so many questions <laughs> Yeah, I definitely had a lot of questions after closing your book. One of my questions was more of a rhetorical one of why people are okay with going to see the mummified remains of people, but often people are uncomfortable with scary movies or seeing violent video games or something like that. How, what is that disconnect that makes people not okay with this, but very okay with seeing human remains Mm. on display. And in your book, you talk about some of the very strange ways that the mummies came from Egypt to England and France. And can you, I don't want you to spoil your whole book, but can you give us a little bit of insight into how that happened in the first place? I think what's very interesting is if you look back they've always been there. They've always been part of our, you know, popular culture, our history, our cultural history. And it goes back to such a land and, you know, so far in history that you're, that, that explains why they know so accepted. And mm-hmm. some of the way that they go back into our history are so curious. So one of, you know, the probably the most curious, probably the most gruesome, probably the strangest one is how... They were part of, you know, medical history, yeah. not for their dissection, but for their actual consumption. So there's this entire history of, you know, mummified bodies being used as like medicine that you would ingest. And that, you'd think, is a very isolated episode. But when you see people like royals using it, you're like, oh, wow, the entanglement with our history is pretty deep. But also, as you say, the disconnect to them being you know, bodies, like dead bodies that, you know, we should at least just respect and, you know, like whether we should see them. Mm-hmm. The disconnect, it starts very, you know, very much there because we used to eat them. And yeah. that's just, you know, a sentence I just never get used to saying. Um, <laughs> but so there is this objectification that goes back a very long time. And so, mm-hmm. you know, through the history, we see this. And I think the disconnect uh, that you mentioned that we don't go and see them as, you know, dead bodies, that, you mm. know, the way that we could think of, of other bodies or other representation. It's because it's so deep that we just completely forget. And of course, you know, popular cultures and all of this, but it's easy to blame popular culture and think it's a very recent phenomenon. Yeah. But actually, no, there's just this this very deep, very multi, multi-layered history of just using them, appropriating them, having very strange reactions to them and so on yeah yeah i w- <laughs> how and why did the first person be like you know what let me eat that who looks at a yeah. mummy and thinks delicious <laughs> so strange so do you think some of this disconnect comes with the language that we use when we talk about mummies for example we use the word mummy often instead of human remains. Do you think that has something to do with this disconnect? Yes, it's a lot of the conversation that's happening, you know, recently with museums, with, you know, researchers and ethics, whether we should completely stop using the word, you know, mummy and some mummified bodies or mummified Mm -hmm. human remains. I think, yes, language is important. I don't think we can suddenly stop using the word mummy without alienating people and saying, well, what you're doing is wrong. Because for Mm. me, the problem is saying to the public, you saying mummy is wrong, we're never going to use it again without explaining the thinking behind it. And so that's very much what I wanted to, to do with Mummified is just, you know, at the end of it, hopefully your views have change it doesn't mean that you will never go and see a mummified body and so on but i don't think saying you calling it a mummy is wrong makes sense (laughs) because first people don't know that very long history but also because it would be very 
it, wouldn't it be a bit ironic if the museum sectors tell people that the way they say things is wrong when we've been feeding them those stories about mummies being, you know, attractive, gruesome. We put mummies as the show of museums mm -hmm. for a reason. We want people to get excited about it, to come to the museum and no saying, well, you know, what you're doing is wrong. That's mm -hmm. just not, that's not how we're going to change. That's how we're going to get people to no longer trust the sector as well. So what I think is important is however you use it. And also because of course, translations in, in all languages don't necessarily work. It's just mm -hmm. putting the human at the heart of conversation. So if you yeah. want to say mummified person, go for it. But you know what? That's not going to really sell on an exhibition. Come see a mummified person. The question <laughs> is have conversation with people. Why do you have mm -hmm. an exhibition about? Because if you have an exhibition about a mummy or if you have an exhibition about a mummified person, you're still putting a body on show. Yeah. That is where the conversation should be. I'm mm -hmm. very keen on rehumanizing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the conversations, the display, the, the thinking around mummies. I don't think that, you know, that is the only way to do it. The way we display them is mm -hmm. often dehumanizing and changing one word is not going to change that. We need to change our mindset. Yeah, I agree. And I think your book is really helping to change that mindset in a really gentle and non-judgmental and like you were saying non-prescriptive way and I think that's the thing that really resonated for me with the book is that it never felt like a lecture it never felt like you were saying you you are a bad person for going and looking at these mummies and you need to change right this very moment I think it was a very gentle and informative way to start this conversation about repersoning mummified remains or mummies mm -hmm. or however you choose to say. So you in your book, you talk about the white mummy returns. And that is something that is really on my mind recently is the repatriation of certain artifacts, certain mummies, certain things. So could you tell us a little bit more about that chapter, The White Mummy Returns? Yes, so it's a it's a chapter that I really wanted to write and was really mm -hmm. hesitant to write because of how polarized the conversations mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. you know, today around topics, around colonialism, around, yeah. you know, race studies. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, the reason that for me it was really important to talk about this is because in the museum sector... Mm -hmm. Egyptian mummified bodies are considered the least controversial human remains. Everyone likes mummies mm -hmm. is what you hear often. And there are a lot of human remains where there is almost no doubt that something wrong happened, that they're here because something wrong happened, right? Yeah. But but in Egyptology, there's always been this sort of, you know, no, it's it's fine. And, and there's a lot of narratives that are very problematic and especially you know, emanating from the two countries that, you know, I lived in, which are, you know, friends. And then I lived in, in England for all my research. So, mm -hmm. and I just felt that if, if I want people to understand that there is something that we need to talk about, then we need to talk about the race studies in the past. So that's the first chapter on this, which is, you know, very much the scientific or pseudo-scientific research that mm -hmm. we're done to try to prove or to manipulate the racial origin of the ancient Egyptians in the context of, you know, colonialism or of empire. And that was very important because I was shocked when I found those, especially the studies done in the Natural History Museum in Paris, which I had never heard of. So those were, you know, as a historian, I felt that was, you know, my duty to talk about this. But at the same time, I thought if I stop there, it looks like all the bad things happen in the past. Yeah. And it's not the case. And it's not mm -hmm. saying the same things are happening. But for me, everything is looking at displacement of practice. Mm. Today, conversations like conversations around the aliens building the pyramids and things like this, they can be very humorous or yeah. they can be what they really are, which yeah. is very problematic conversations about denying the potential, the capacity, the ability, mm. the knowledge of the ancient Egyptians, because people today still struggle with thinking that they're not superior to everything and everyone. And yes. for me, that is what, you know, the white mummy returns is um, is about. It's very much saying, well, you know, those conversations that are complicated and that have 
sort of that place Egyptology at the center of other conversations that is not just a little field, but actually has an impact on the narratives, they still matter today. The way we frame Egypt today in museums, the way we locate it separately from the continent where it is and so on, it has an impact. It frames, you know, museums were created for this, you know, to frame the world. And so mm-hmm. that's that's what it's about. It's talking about the fact that, you know, when we talk, when we do DNA studies today, they're not neutral. And we have to be aware of that. And sometimes the way that they're communicated, the intention's not wrong, but we have to keep in mind that we we exist, researchers, and sometimes we forget it in the global world, you know? And so the conversations that we have, they have an impact, but also because ancient Egypt today mm-hmm. still has such a hold on people and how yeah. they understand the world. And it's quite curious, but we still very much want to understand ancient Egypt to understand the world. And, you know, the pyramids still have such a hold because people want to know and the reasons they want to know who created them, who built them, how they were built, often they're not neutral. What they want is they want the answers that benefits them. And that was the case in the past. I'm not saying everyone, but I'm saying that a lot of people also, because for me, a lot of people that do the you know alien jokes, they don't yeah. understand the actual, you know, the historical background. They think when I explain that, they're like, oh, God, you know, I've made, you know, I've been making this joke and now I feel, you know, pretty terrible that I didn't realize. So that's why I wanted to talk about this. It's a tricky chapter and mm-hmm. I don't have an answer to, especially in this chapter, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I think it's a conversation to put out there. And there's a yeah. lot of other people that are doing similar conversations. And so for me, it's an invitation to go and think about it. Sergeant and Mr. Smith, you're going to love this house. Bunk beds in a closet? There's no field manual for finding the right home. But when you do, USAA Homeowners Insurance can help protect it the right way. Restrictions apply. Achieve clean, healthy-looking skin with Youth to the People. The 20-time award-winning superfood cleanser gently deep cleanses and removes makeup and SPF in 30 seconds. For skin that's hydrated, balanced, and soothed, never stripped, it's the green juice cleanse for your face. Formulated with good-for-you antioxidants like kale, spinach, and multivitamins to respect your barrier. No disruption. Find out why one cleanser is sold every minute in the U.S. Shop now at Sephora. Yeah. I think that you navigated that really well and very delicately. And I'm a big fan of that chapter because it was very thought provoking. And for me as well, I, I very, very much dislike, and I hesitate to use the word hate, but I kind of hate it when people make these jokes about the ancient aliens building pyramids. And I have found that recently on, especially TikTok, TikTok is a place where pseudoscience and conspiracy historians and archaeologists find themselves large audiences. And there's even lots of documentaries, again, hesitate to use that word, that have come out recently that are not based in reality. They're based in conspiracy and pseudoscience. So I think having your book is a really great glass of cold water, a very refreshing mm-hmm. thing to read in the face of so much misinformation. So you were talking earlier about the kind of uncomfortable ways that the mummies came to Paris and England. And is there one story in particular that you don't mind sharing? I think it's not, for me, the most interesting, revealing, and comfortable stories are not the ones about the ones that arrived. So first we have very little, you know, trustability on a lot of them. Yeah. It's the stories of the ones that were brought by boat, which is of course the most usual, you know, the way that we would transport them from Egypt. It's all the stories of the ones that did not make it that for me are so revealing. So there's this chapter where I, I just like feel like it's an endless list of absolute disaster at sea. (laughs) <laughs> but it's so interesting where, you know, people would bring mummified bodies in the most sort of random way. They'd go to Egypt, they're like, you know, adventurers, they're diplomats, and they're like, mm-hmm. I'm going to bring a mummy because that is how you come back and look cool. 
you know, it's terrible, but that's just, you know, that's the way. So they would do that and then they would have no idea how to transport them. Uh, they would just put them in like a, a box that's not the coffin because they would sell the coffin separately, you know, to make money. So that's why most of the Egyptian mummified bodies in museums today, the coffin you see on this, but probably not theirs. Um, yeah. But... It's also like the people that are like the sailors that are like, well, actually, I did not sign up to have a dead body on my boat. And there's a lot of sort of anxiety around there and um, a lot of superstitions around, the, uh, around, you know, just having dead bodies on mm-hmm. on board of a boat. So there's all these moments where they literally throw them up the boat and they just throw them at sea. Because, you know, the sailors are like, it's you or the, or the mummy. So, of course, you know, they just, or sometimes they're like, well, you're not, you know, you can't have an entire body. So they chop the head off and just throw the head off and then just bring the rest. And it's just this moment where you're like, I think because we try to rationalize the fact that so many bodies were brought, you know, and they're like, well, you know, it's for studies. For No, most of the Egyptian mummified bodies, and I'm not talking about artifacts, I'm talking about bodies, they were brought by people who just wanted to be like, and here is what I brought back from holidays without much thinking. Yeah. And so a lot of, you know, there's a lot of incidents about mummified bodies decaying once they arrive in Europe. There's all those incidents of them being, you know, and for me, the ones that don't make it, they're the almost the most important stories Mm. because then it really makes this world process seem just completely ridiculous. You know, like you actually dig bodies out of graves. Obviously different people did that, but you, you know, stop the afterlife and the wish and the prosperity and the, you know, serenity of someone Mm -hmm. to just take it in your suitcase. And then, and then you're like, Oh, okay. Well, you know, I'd rather make the trip than the mummy. And you just throw it off the boat. And that really, for me, is just the the absurdity sometimes. And yeah. what we see when we see human remains in museum is such a small proportion that so many decades, so many were just lost, so many. And it's just this transactional way yeah. to deal with, you know, the body of someone from another culture, from another time. For me, those are the interesting stories because yeah. it just makes every you know conversation that we have on how to be ethical in mm. museums with human remains almost ridiculous. Like it's just, it's already too late. We've done you know so much yeah. that you know. Well, now we're like, well, you know, with the ones that we have left, what do we do? But so much of the stories behind the scene in the past, you know, even in storages, you know, mm. mummified bodies lying on the floor and stuff like this, it really. Mm-hmm puts into context the sort of the strangeness yeah. of this practice. Yeah, I, th- I think, I can't remember what chapter it was, but when you describe a room that you went into that just had a bunch of different human remain parts just everywhere, just all over the place. I Yeah, the Science it, Museum in London, yes. Yes, yes, the Science Museum in London. I, like, I put the book down. I was like, whoa, ho- hold on. This is real. This is a real thing. And it made me like so sad. I was so sad when I read that part. Of of course, I had to continue reading. But what was that moment like for you? I read your thoughts in the book, but I would love to know Mm. what your thoughts are now after, you know, it's been almost two years since you've finished the book. What are those feelings just as raw as they were then? I think for, for me, so this was my postdoctoral uh, research here in, mm-hmm. in London. And that was very much a shift because my doctoral thesis wasn't so much about ethics. It was very historical. So it was mm-hmm. very much understanding what we've just talked about, the processes, mm-hmm. the thinking, the intellectual ideas that, you know, it's and a lot of very, you know, sort of archive heavy research for, for mm-hmm. my doctoral thesis. Then I moved to, you know, the Science Museum and for a year, it's about public engagement, but it's mm-hmm. also a lot more sort of, you know, real in a, in a physical sense, where for a couple of months, I go to, to the storage of a collection that's actually, you know, from Henry Welcome. So the, the, just the absolute, you know, craziest mass collector yeah. that just collected everything and, 
but also had you know very sort of disturbing complicated you know mm. thinking around you know uh, extra european bodies and and so i walk into this room and it's very small and i've obviously seen human remains before i've interned at the louvre so i've also you know seen them with a storage but only egyptian mummified bodies and so mm. you have this very clinical room as i as i you know call it in the book mm. because it's very well done it's very you know everything's covered up there's you know it's very respectful so that if you know someone comes and changes a light bulb they do not have to you know see human remains it's and mm. which is very obviously very important Mm-hmm. And I sit here, and so I open all the um, the cases, and so so some all of a sudden everything's very visible, and I just mm-hmm. sit here, and it's you know people think that our walk and our research is very exciting, it's very thrilling, it's very mm-hmm. movie like, but actually you know you're like wearing gloves, and the smell of just products for you know conservation, mm-hmm. but also mm-hmm. the use of arsenic at the time and things like this, and you sit here, and you look around, and you're like, there's a thousand you know human remains. And all mm. I could think is, what the hell, you know, like, how did right? we end up with being in a situation where, you know, there's like heads on shelves, there's, you know, and you just look around and you're like, it's like when we say that the museum is, you know, sort of a micro world, you know, mm-hmm. that it represents the world. In that moment, you sit in a room and you're like, this is what that means. Yeah. But it's not the world, it's the history. You don't want to know. You yeah. want to not think about, because you're like, well, I'm sitting and I'm literally seeing the world because human remains in that room come from all around the world. But mm. I'm also seeing, you know, all of these very complicated, very disturbing mm. chapters of history that are also in this room. And I'm like, yeah. well, this is like a little bubble of the world but of the world we don't want to talk about you know and it's it's very interesting and I think in those moments this is why I'm so particular about doing more conversations around emotions because Mm. if that does not make you feel anything I don't think you should be in that field you know because if you sit in that room and you're like well yeah it's just the past people used to do that Mm-hmm. Then, then that's how we can now emotionally engage with people around these questions. Because yeah. I'm very used to engaging with human remains. So, you know, when people ask, are you afraid of not, or, you know, of, of, you know, seeing them? No, I'm afraid of the history that I'm yeah. seeing. I'm, you know, it's just, I'm like, I'm not terrified of those bodies. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm that I'm opening those cases and I'm mm-hmm. sitting here, you know, I wasn't even 30 at the time. And I'm like, why do I have access to all of you yeah. when you know you should not be here i'm in london and i'm just you know doing my little you know uh, <laughs> post doctorate you know research and i'm like this scenario mm. is just you know should it really be a thing should i be sitting here and yeah. it's just you know it's very emotional you find if you're not emotional i think you just get submerged by the things that you're seeing but it's very and it's very interesting, especially when you think that most of it, maybe not all of it at the same museums, but most of this room is is one man that had massive wealth and that just went on, you know, this this crazy collecting mania. Wow. That I completely agree with you that it's so important to bring back the emotion into history and archaeology. I think for so long, things have been very clinical, been very cut off from emotion, which is important when you are doing research and other things to take our emotions out of it. But I think for a long time, emotions have been taken too much out of things Mm. and things have become too clinical to where we can't understand that, yeah, these people lived 5,000, 4,000 years ago, but they were also people. They were also human beings. Mm. So I... I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> so let's shift a little bit so we're not so doom and gloom this whole time because I <laughs> I don't want to steer people away from reading your book. <laughs> so how did you tackle not having images of remains? Your book has pictures, very lovely pictures. So what what kind of pictures did you put in? How did you navigate that whole no remains in the book? So for me, it's a questions that I've had for mummy stories. What Mm -hmm. do I do? Because now I have a website that's just going to be black and white text. Yeah, right. (laughs) It's a question that I've had for mummified. 
And then I'm working on a new book now and mm -hmm. it's going to be a mostly picture book, you know, so like a coffee table book. So a very yeah. visual book. Yeah. And the same thing will apply. And, and the number of, of photographs is going to be just so much more. I can't mm. give a lot of details, but it's, and, and no, the, the, um, the challenge is, uh, even greater because yeah. if the idea is it's visual, for mummified, there's about 30 photographs there, you know, mm. black and white. I think for me, it's, it's been really interesting because at the end of the day, mummified bodies in museums, they don't exist on their own. Mm. So there's all these, you know, objects, all these spaces that they inhabit, the museum and so on. Um, but there's also all of these, you know, historical photographs or like posters for, you know, exhibitions and things that mm. actually, if you go and write a book about mummies, you're just going to put 30 pictures of mummies because that's it, job done. But you actually don't really put them in context, right? If you yeah. remove that, I'm like, well, actually, you know, there is this coffin and the coffin is part of, you know, the the body and it's part of the journey and so on. Mm -hmm. That no, it's gorgeous and no one actually shares. And then there is this museum space or there's this historical, you know, engraving of, I absolutely adore those of like, you know, people going to the British Museum to see the mummy room or like mm -hmm. the first ever engraving of, you know, the Louvre mummy room, which, you know, has been very little published because if you're going to write about, you know, Egyptian mummies at the Louvre, just put a photograph of Pasheri, right? The, the mummified man. Yeah. But if you don't, then all of a sudden you're going to go in the archive and be like, oh God, that's where they were displayed before. That's really interesting. Or like there's, you know, those paintings of, you know, people first painting at the Louvre and so on. So actually it just makes it a lot more creative, but it's also a very interesting way of putting, you know, those bodies into context. So I mentioned it a few times in, in you know, in, in the book, but like there's this Egyptian mummy that's on display in one room and then it changes, it goes upstairs and then it goes downstairs. And every time it changes location, the narrative changes and the narrative changes, but the body doesn't. So it does mean mm. that the space it's in, it affects it. So there's this one in England where it was, you know, near like a, an actual water pound in a museum, <laughs> uh, in the basement. It was like sort of yeah, recreating yeah. ancient garden but you can see how that environment would would impact the way that it's displayed in the story that is told because all of a sudden it's like imagine you're in the afterlife and this is their dream garden if you put it on a display in like you know a, a room with lots of like other artifacts from other culture the mm -hmm. story is going to be different so if you don't actually focus on the photograph of the body you have all mm -hmm. of these great stories. And I mean, you know, Egyptian mummies in museums, it's also the history of museums. It's not just the history of Egyptology. It's yeah. the history of people coming to museum. You look at the engraving from the British Museum, you can definitely see that it's people from the upper class. It tells you something about access to museums. Who used to go? It's interesting to see, you know, those very elegantly, richly dressed women sort of picking at a mummified body and thinking, you know, what did how did that go how what did they think at that time yeah. was you know a lady seeing a dead body or was it really already you know the disconnect was already there because yeah. i would assume that it, you know, so all of these stories you actually think about them if you don't put those photographs yes i couldn't have said it better myself and i love the pictures that you put in of other people looking at mummies i think there's one mm -hmm. cartoon of a man who he's got his tiny little glasses and he's yeah. looking at a mummy in a case and i love that because it gives yeah it's fantastic this is definitely going in the second book because it's just it's a bit <laughs> of like a caricature but it's you know it's so interesting mm -hmm. because it, it's it's not recent and at the same time it feels like a very almost you look at it and you're like oh god that's what I used to do in museum and it's kind right. of like it's it's staring at you and it's kind of judging you in the way that those sort of you know like kind of cynical caricature were like you know this is you and yeah. it's fantastic I really like it because I'm like well I, instead of putting a photograph and you look at the photograph no there's a man doing what you were about <laughs> to do if you looked at the photograph so yeah it's a great one Exactly. I feel like it's like a little joke in the midst of trying to navigate these ethical and moral questions. You're like, oh, this guy is doing the thing that I would be doing right now. And yep. I love it. I love those. And I think that it really does show another level of creativity and historiography 
of looking at not only the history of these mummies, but the history of the museums that the mummies were in. So I, I just love it. I cannot sing the praises of your book enough. It was so great. And at the risk of just revealing everything in the book, I want people to still <laughs> go <laughs> read your book. Um, is there any final message that you'd like to tell the listeners? Any final thing that you'd like to say to uh, wrap up our interview today? I think that because I'm desperately optimist about everything <laughs> I think that what I want people to realize is that Egyptian mummies are very important mm. and they're also not very important you know in the global scheme of things today you're like okay well, why would I read about Egyptian mummies why would I care why would you spend your entire life you know studying this topic <laughs> are they not more you know pressing issues mm -hmm. But if we look at Egyptian mummified bodies differently, mm. if we look at them at a topic that we are so used to not questioning, mm -hmm. we don't question Egyptian mummies. They're everywhere. They've always been there. They're fine. They don't have call for repatriations the way other you know, human remains have or on the same level. It's fine. But then if you start digging and you're like, oh, I never thought about this. I never questioned this. I never asked questions. Yes, actually, I've been going since I was a kid. Never even, you know, thought of them as like, you know, dead people, like yeah. kind of, but yeah, did not really think about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I take my kids and I'm just like, it's a fun thing to do. Once you start questioning this, I'm not saying you start thinking it's wrong. Just you mm -hmm. ask questions. Why do I do this? Why did people bring them? Should we really do this? Should we think about it differently? Mm. On a topic that is so familiar, then you will start thinking and asking questions about other topics, about museum topics, but about, you know, society, the things that we do without thinking, the things that we're like, it's always been like that. I've mm. always done that. Mm. Then it has a rippling effect. And yeah. for me, what I want is people to ask more questions yeah. about anything they want, just mm -hmm. to be curious, to question their practice and their habits, and and just, you know, to have these conversations that are more emotional than human. You mm -hmm. have them about Egyptian mummified bodies, great. But if you have them about a completely different topic, if you never open that book again, but you're like, actually, in which other field in which other topic in which other areas of my life can I think a little differently can I ask a little more questions can I be a little more emotional yeah I really think that this is gonna have you know an impact on our film but also on us as people I know because as I said I wasn't doing this before even yeah. though I had been in this field but it has changed the way that I think about things but it also has changed the way that I work on other projects that are unrelated just because now I'm like, well, what if we turn things upside down? Mm -hmm. What if we look at a different angle? For me, that's what's really important. And I think Egypt and mummies being two topics that are so universal somehow. Yeah. Like you and I right now are on completely yeah. opposite side of the world. <laughs> yeah. And we're having this conversation. If we take those two topics that everyone's so interested about mm -hmm. and we just look at them differently... I think we can, you know, we can make great changes. Yeah. That's what I want, you know, people to do. So, you know, read it and then just apply it to something else. Whether you go to see mummified bodies in museums or not after that, as long as I've, you, you've done these little shifts, as long as you close it and you're like, oh, great, I want it answer. And now I have so many more questions. <laughs> then my job's done. That's what I want to do, you know, tell stories and make people think. I love it. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Dr. Angela. I really, really appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, creating this absolutely excellent book. I can't thank you enough for your time. So uh, is there any final thing that you'd like to plug? Where can people find you? Is there any other books that you're working on or things that you'd like to promote? Now is your time. The stage is yours. <laughs> 
Um, I think the only thing is that, you know, the support has been so lovely from you and from so many people that the only thing I'd share is that it's going to come in paperback next year, which is very nice to continue the conversations. And uh, I'm working on another one, but for this one, you have to brush up on your French because it's actually coming up uh, in French uh, next year. But there will be lots of pictures. Um, <laughs> but other than that, the only thing I'd say is just, you know, really just keep supporting uh, writers and authors because it's been a wonderful journey and it's also... Mm -hmm. A lot more complex than a lot of people think so things like you know what you do is just wonderful so thank you so much for your oh. work as well oh thank you so much that's so kind of you so i will put all of the links to dr angela's website uh where to get the book and her social medias all of that fun stuff in the show notes below so that you can continue to help support her by uh, getting the book or requesting it at your library. So thank you so much. Yes. And I will see you in the outro. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, dear one, thank you so much for joining Dr. Angela and I for this wonderful episode talking about her book. Who knew a book on mummies could be so interesting without any pictures of mummies? And I'm about to say something controversial yet brave even more interesting than your run-of-the-mill mummy book, I think. But that just, that's, that's just me. That is just me. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode and you would like to support Dr. Angela, you can head down to the show notes to find all of the places where you can buy her book. And if you uh, like to support things in, which <laughs> we're talking about right now, <laughs> you can, God, that was a, the, probably the worst segue I've ever done. Um, Anyways, if you like support and you want to support <laughs> this podcast, you can head down to the show notes as well for all sorts of ways to support for the love of history. You could get some amazing merch. It's very cute and very comfy. You could join us over on Patreon for lots of bonus content, for early access to episodes, for so many fun things over there. You can also donate to the For the Love of History app, which we are still holding donations for. If you haven't heard about that, you can head on over to the website where I tell you all about it, what it is, why we're doing it. And uh, if you haven't already, one of the best free 99 ways to support For the Love of History is to leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts because that's the only way Apple Podcasts is going to know that you think this is a good podcast and other people should know about it. And um, another free 99 way is by subscribing over on YouTube and you can see my lovely face and the lovely face of all my guests and the not so lovely faces of the people that we talk about the garbage humans to be particular and the very lovely faces of the empress baddies and all of the various other things that we talk about <laughs> i'm rambling i'm a little bit tired so i'm gonna go and drink some water maybe a coffee and uh i'll see you next week when we talk about the deadly history of tea and boy howdy let me tell you let me tell you friend the bibliography on this one is long so strap in all right do something for yourself to make you happy go outside touch your grass drink some water and i'll see you next week okay love you so much bye why is there a metronome right now oh, okay <laughs> hello everyone it's takuyi here and i'm gabby and we are the hosts of history of everything a podcast which you can probably guess by the name is well I mean, it's about everything. Do you want to know why people thought potatoes were evil and would give you syphilis? Are you curious about all the stories of the terrible and stupid ways that people have kicked the bucket over the years? Do you want to hear tales about all of the different badasses of history and the lives that they had brought to life? Well, if so, then look no further. History of Everything is just the right podcast for you. It's available on Spotify, Pandora, and anywhere else that you get your podcast from. Join us for some fun and just see how weird and wacky history can be.